Well, good morning, everybody. Today, I'm going to talk to you about anomaly detection and more especially the unsupervised cases, which we'll, you will see are a lot more funnier than you should expect. Uh, so my name is Harizo. I work as a data scientist at Dataiku. And uh, before we get started, two things. First thing, a small outline of where we're going to go. First, I'm going to give a small introduction by defining the context of what's the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Then we will see some of the algorithms that can be used for the unsupervised case and how do you assess their performances. Next, we're going to talk about how you would properly report detected outlier. And finally, we will conclude and branch out on open topics. Second thing, quick word about my employer, which uh, graciously sent me here. Uh, so we're a French company. We were founded almost four years ago. Uh, we build an end-to-end -end data science platform uh, that aims at being collaborative. Here is a small sample of our customers. And for the rest of the story, you can check us out. We have a booth. We have a demo this afternoon. And that's it for the shameless plug. Let's go <laughs> straight to the presentation. So the uh, introduction. So before delving into the details, a first explanation about where do you encounter anomaly detection? Well, basically, you can meet all those problems pretty much everywhere. Uh, those are the most common examples. You may have the classical ones, fraud detection problem. You want to flag fraudulent transactions or fraudulent claims. Uh, predictive maintenance, if you want to check whether or not your manufacturing plant is running well. Uh, healthcare, if you want to monitor patients and see whether they're showing weird symptoms or not during a treatment, or even network monitoring for security guys if they want to identify network surges or drops, or even see if their network was breached. Uh, and one important thing to notice is that anomaly detection is a machine learning part in data science projects. And as I think most of you know, the machine learning part is just the small part in the data science project. You also have to connect your data sources provide all the data preparation slash feature engineering that is necessary for your algorithm to run. So today, we're going to focus only on the, the end of the flow here, which is anomaly detection. Here, this is a small example of one project in our tool, the Data Science Studio. Uh, this one was basically to identify fraud in Medicare, uh, Medicare data. Uh, and yeah, those last three blocks are anomaly detection, and those are the ones we're going to focus on today. So let's start by giving a few definitions, very simple definition regarding what are inliers and outliers. Inliers are, well, the majority of your data uh, that uh, represent what we may call the normality, whereas outliers, they represent a small portion of the data and they, sh they tell you that something is not going on well. So for what we call supervised anomaly detection, what you have is a data set with features and labels telling whether or not your data point is an anomaly or an outlier. So uh, it boils down to a, let's say, classical you know, supervised classification problem where you have a binary setup and you also need to take extra steps to take care of the high class imbalance while doing cross validation. Let's complicate things a bit. And now suppose that we only have data that represents normality. So the data is labeled, but we only have inliers, not outliers. This is what we may call semi-supervised anomaly detection. So basically here, the goal of the model will be to, let's say, learn normality. That's why you, we often call those models one-class models. And when you put it uh, into, let's say, production, uh, you will have on outliers, but they will only appear at, let's say, test time. So while you train your model, you will not see any outlier. That's why we also talk about novelty detection. And now for the worst case scenario, you have a training data set that has no label at all. Here we are in the fully unsupervised case. And uh, you, we, we will make the assumption that our data potentially contains a sufficiently small amount of outlier. Uh, so. This worst case scenario uh, happens quite, quite often, actually. If we take the example of, uh, let's say, uh, warranty fraud detection, uh, if you want to label all your claims, that may take you time and cost you a lot of money. Uh, you can also have unre unreliable labels. If you're not sure about whether or not in your manufacturing plant, when you're doing predictive maintenance, your sensor is reliable on telling whether or not this machine is going well, 
then your label are not 100% accurate. And finally, you can also have the possibility of overfitting. If you only have a few portion of label data in your whole training data set, you may not want to say that those outliers are all the possible outliers that I may uh, encounter, because what you want is first to be able to generalize. So in a more schematic way, here is an example how, of how you would process a semi-supervised problem. So you have your training data set here, you have your uh, anomaly detection algorithm that sees that it trains only on the normality, and then once you get new data that doesn't have label at the start, you will get, by using, uh, let's call the decision function, an anomaly score that will reflect whether or not your data points are being outliers or not. And then for the fully unsupervised case, the case which we will focus on uh, during this presentation, no labels at all, train your algorithm, and apply the uh, decision function to get the anomaly score on each of your data points. Okay, so now uh, let's talk more about algorithms. What kind of tools do we have to deal with these kind of problems, and how do we assess their performance? So here I'm going to focus on three algorithms. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of them that exist, uh, but I'm going to focus on the three that, that are available in the scikit-learn library as of the latest version, which is 0.19. Uh, so the first one is called one class support vector machines. So maybe some of you heard about support vector machines in the supervised case. Well, basically the idea is to say, in the supervised case, you have a binary classification problem and you want to draw, let's say, an optimal boundary between your two classes, potentially by uh, moving your points into another space, which we, we call the kernel space. Here in the unsupervised case, the idea is to say, okay, I only have potentially one class that is normality, and what I want to do is potentially move those data points into my kernel space, and let's say define a boundary following the same uh, optimization rules than in a supervised case, but between my normality case and the origin of the, of the kernel feature space. Uh, so this algorithm can handle very well uh, highly nonlinear cases, but uh, can also struggle when you have to define hyperparameters, which are far from being trivial to define, and also uh, can struggle if you are working with high dimensional data sets. Another class of algorithm is uh, tree based methods. Uh, especially here, we have the isolation forest. Uh, so basically, it's a set of randomized decision trees that are, in a way, uh, more intuitive than the uh, one class SVM, because what you're going to do is to say, basically, if I am able to, to quickly differentiate outliers versus inliers, then I win. The example here is telling me that, for example, I have the tree on the left, and I want to say to see whether or not my house is an, in, is an outlier in a given neighborhood. So if, we, if you take a look at the feature shape of the roof, here you only have one house in the whole neighborhood that has a pointy roof. So it reaches already the end of this branch in the tree. So it qualifies as an outlier because uh, you can like quickly distinguish it from the rest. For the other one, you have to say, okay, the roof is flat, I have two windows, uh, my neighbors look like me, I have a car parked, parked out front, and the more questions you need to ask, the less likely it is to be an outlier. That's basically the, the system, how it works. Uh, the biggest advantage of this method is that it is uh, parallelizable, uh, the scikit-learn implementation offers a way to parallelize that using uh, the joblib tool. And a third method, uh, which was implemented in the latest version of scikit-learn, is a uh, distance-based ba distance method that uh, is slightly derived from the k-nearest neighbors. That says, basically, I'm going to say that I have my uh, feature space, I compute distances on that, and my thumb rule is to say that if my data point is lonely, and if my neighbors are lonely, then it's okay, I'm an inlier, else I'm an outlier. This offers you the advantage to identify, let's say, local outliers, so points that, uh, that are outliers, but not as much as other points. For example, this point here is what we call a global outlier, whereas this point here, it's not that far from this cluster that may represent normality, so it, doesn't, it has a higher anomaly score than the average, 
but not as high as the global outlier. So uh, this method is, uh, it's not that, that recent, but it has the inconvenience of having to compute distances and again, we, you get hit by uh, the curse of dimensionality. The more dimensions you have in your data sets, uh, the more costly it is to compute your distances. So uh, how should you evaluate those algorithms? Uh, we can take a first step and say, OK, uh, let's imagine that I have very simple two-dimension data, and I want to see whether or not my points are outliers. Uh, here, I have two clusters representing normality, and a few points that were sampled at random over the space that represent outliers. And the idea is to say, OK, I will fit my algorithms on those data points and then apply a decision function on a predefined grid of my domain so that I'm able to plot maps, uh, decision maps, and to see where are the regions where I potentially contain inliers and outliers. So that's okay for like very simple examples, but in practice and in real life, you don't get two-dimensional data sets, of course. So let's go to something a little bit more complicated. So we took three data sets from actually benchmarks. First one is a uh, credit card transaction data set that is available on Kaggle. And the two other one, page blocks and internet ads, are uh, data sets that are mostly used for research to benchmark those, alg those algorithms. Uh, this is a little bit more realistic than the previous case, because here you will have numerical or uh, categorical slash binary features, and you will have more data points and more dimensions. And we, we also vary the outlier ratio to see whether or not our algorithms are able to flag outliers depending on how many outlier on how many outliers uh, actual outliers the dataset contains. Okay, so how should we do that? Well, uh, the thing is, we actually need the labels at benchmark time. So you train your model, you hide those labels, but and it's only at evaluation time that you see, okay, my algorithm flagged this, this, this as anomaly scores. I want to compare with the actual results. So one way to do so is to plot the uh, classical uh, ROC curves why, uh, and put uh, false positive ratios versus true positive ratios. And you can interpret them uh, similarly as you would interpret a classification problem, basically. Uh, so here, you can see that we here we used the uh, default parameters of the algorithm. We did not tweak any hyperparameters. And you can see that it tends to work better for uh, the one class SVM in the isolation forest, and the uh, local outlier factor struggles a bit. Here we have to be careful not to draw like uh, conclusions quickly. Uh, let's not say that the LOF is, uh, is not that good uh, at detecting outlier, but rather it's not an algorithm that can easily be used out of the box. You have to tweak the hyperparameters to increase the performance. You also have computation time that matters. Uh, we emphasize the fact that we have algorithms that are sensible to dimensionality. Here you can see that by the example. For the same data set and less performance, you see that the local outlier factor is doing slightly less, well, if not uh, very worse, than uh, isolation forests in the parallel, parallelized version and the one class SVM. Uh, again, uh, those results are to be taken uh, with precaution because here you only have uh, some kind of snapshot with the default parameters, but it already gives you an overview of how do those algorithms compare in terms of performance. So now let's switch to the part where we actually want to report outliers. It's fine to have algorithms that score data points, but then how do you report that to your colleagues? How do you report that to the business? Well, the thing is, when you're doing a supervised classification, what you get is a probability of belonging to a certain class. In the unsupervised case, what you get is those complicated anomaly scores, which unless you are really, really, really good, you don't know how to interpret them properly. Another thing is that when you compare several algorithms in a supervised case, you're comparing probabilities that by design are on the same scale. Here, from one algorithm to another, the anomaly score are defined differently so it doesn't make sense to compare them as is. So question is, how should we compare them? What would be the solution? 
Well, actually, there are several solutions. One of them would be, would be to say, OK, let's take my anomaly scores and transform them into a ranking. So I will choose one algorithm among those I tried out. I will compute ranks and say, for the highest anomaly score, this is rank number one. For the second highest anomaly score, this is rank number two, and so on. And then you will sort those points. That will allow you to build a shortlist. If you take the top n points or the top n percent of the shortlist, you will be able to get this shortlist that is your, uh, the list of the, your most, let's say, suspicious data points. If we apply this methodology to uh, the uh, credit card fraud data sets using the isolation forest algorithm, you can see here, I'm not sure if everybody sees, but basically uh, we have for the top 10 already flagged six outliers out of uh, more than 30 over more than 17k data points. And by doing so, you are actually building a proxy of like building this ROC curve we talked about earlier because if you plot the rank of the data points versus the number of matched outliers, you, see, you get the exact shape of the ROC curve. But in a way, you have here a ranking and if you go to your business colleagues and say, okay, I run my de de anomaly detection methods, here are your uh, suspects. They will be happy because they will not have to look for what does a LOF score means in reality and so on. You also have to keep in mind that you don't, you're not, uh, be, you, you will not be able to flag all of your outliers. You will make errors and you will ha have to account for which type of errors you're going to make, to make and which impact on the business this will have. Uh, if you have false positive, let's say, your, your algorithm concur on giving a data point a high rank, being uh, putting that point uh, as a uh, potential outlier, but actually it's not. What are the business consequences? If you're doing, uh, I'm going back to the uh, warranty uh, fraud uh, problem. If you flag a false positive, you launch an investigation on your customer. It costs you time, it costs you money, and in the end, uh, you don't get the result you expected because uh, the algorithm was wrong. So that makes for a bad customer experience, and that also costs you some resources. On the other end, you also, ha you also might have false negatives. That's the other way around. You give a data point a low rank, but it is actually an outlier. And we do have some of them in the credit card data set here. You have uh, ranks that, uh, that range from uh, ranked 12,000, 11,000, uh, 14,000, 14, but whereas it is actually an outlier. That's a well-hidden outlier. And then, in terms of business, you have to think about what would be the damage of not detecting this outlier. It's not just about the metric, it's, uh, it's to say, how much will it cost to the company if, we, if we're not able to detect this kind of outlier? And that's also what uh, the business is interested in. Well, to solve these kind of problems, we do have several solutions. What, we, you, what you can do is here, we had like three algorithms. What, what you can see is, okay, I'll try to average the rankings to provide maybe a, a more robust results and potentially put weights on each of these algorithms uh, with respect to the confidence I give, I give them. What you can also do is talk with the domain experts and the business people about how can you be able to build custom filters, custom rules, to, let's say, enhance those top lists. If, for example, you're in a business that wants to flag fraudulent transactions, but you don't want, uh, you're not interested in small, uh, small amounts, you can say, okay, uh, I will put a filter uh, before, my, uh, before the building of my shortlist, saying that I will discard all the uh, transactions that are less than a given threshold because it might cost the company uh, no money compared to more uh, important amounts. And here, uh, this is, let's say, a partial conclusion that says uh, solving anomaly detection problems in the unsupervised case uh, can be done in a much better way if you talk with your colleagues, especially from the domain uh, expert people and from the business people. Uh, that's something that I've heard a lot during the, the, the conference, uh, communication and collaboration between data scientists and domain experts is important, especially in those kinds of problems. 
Okay, so we're slightly coming to the end of the talk. So if we want to summarize what, we s what we've seen so far, uh, outlier detection when you have unlabeled data is a difficult task. And it can be solved and seen as a first step, not a complete methodology, but a first step towards building a short list of suspicious data points. You do have several implementation of those algorithms available, mostly in Python and R, uh, but the task remains difficult because you often need uh, actual label availability. Tuning your algorithms is not something easy, especially when it comes to complicated hyperparameters. And for those interested, this is an area of active research. Uh, there is a workshop at the ICML conference dedicated to anomaly detection. So uh, feel free to check out their papers. They're really good quality. And in the end, on the last point, but uh, I, in, my, uh, in my opinion, the most important, talk to your business people, talk to your domain experts, go to them and say, does my ranking make sense? Uh, does uh, this point uh, actually look like an outlier for you, who, uh, for people who already have the experience on investigating on those kind of outliers, and will provide you a very useful insights on how could you enhance your algorithm and even your data preparation and your feature engineering. Another thing is that those uh, algorithms are evolving pretty fast. Uh, as I said, it's an area of active research, and you have also different, let's say, families of methods. Here I presented on only three of them, but know that you also have other distance-based methods. You have simpler statistical methods that start from the assumption that your data follows a given distribution, and an outlier is another data point that does not fit well with this, with this distribution. And you also have clustering-based approach, which is basically you're doing, you're doing your clustering. And if you have data points that do not fit quite well with the inferred cluster, then you can consider it as an outlier. And for the mandatory deep learning part, for those who are interested, you also have anomaly detection using a deep neural network. Uh, those are two examples uh, of articles with interesting results. First one regarding image uh, computer vision. Uh, where basically they're using autoencoders to learn the concept of normality. And you also have all the aspects of uh, time series where you combine anomaly detection with forecasting. And the appropriate architecture would then be uh, the uh, RNNs. So uh, Uber, they have, they've written a paper and they also have a very interesting blog article on their page regarding that. So I think I'm done. So thank you for your attention. And this picture is to say that uh, not all uh, well-hidden outliers uh, are dangerous. Thanks, and... Uh